Honestly, if you are trying to protect your whole neighborhood, firing powerful lasers in random directions yep. definitely won't help. Today we're going to be looking at another very heavily requested XKCD What If video. Specifically, could you make an umbrella out of lasers? Well, the question is phrased, could you? And the answer is, yeah, probably, but it would be a very expensive umbrella. And I don't think the FAA would appreciate it too much. I know in a nuclear power plant, you have to notify them whenever the, the flashing lights on top of the reactor containment building domes are burnt out. So shooting a massive laser up into the sky, yeah, they probably wouldn't appreciate that too much. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check out this craziness. From Zach, who asks, Stopping rain from falling on something with an umbrella is boring. What if you tried to stop rain with a laser that targeted and vaporized each incoming droplet before it could come within 10 feet of the ground? Now that's an interesting idea. Let's just go ahead and target the cloud, at least according to this diagram. Go ahead and punch a hole through that thing that's dropping all the rain on you. I'm sure that's not going to have any adverse weather consequences. <laughs> so stopping rain with a laser is one of those ideas that sounds totally reasonable, but... Well, okay. Well, the idea of a laser umbrella might be appealing, it... Okay. The idea of stopping rain with a laser is a thing we are currently talking about. Now, it's not a very practical idea. First, let's look at how much energy the laser would need. Vaporizing a liter of water takes about 2.6 megajoules of energy, and a big rainstorm might drop half an inch of rain per hour. Oddly enough, you can just multiply these two numbers together in a smart calculator like Wolfram Alpha or I love Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> or Google. And the units work out to give you an answer in terms of power per surface area, which is exactly what we're looking for. The calculator... Yeah, that's, that's a lot. So in nuclear power plants, you look at power density like this. So power per unit area or even per linear foot. That's one of the things you look at when you're designing a reactor core. And what's really important about this is you want it to be relatively even throughout the core. You don't want hot spots because that's just going to make... Um, temperature distribution in the reactor get off, more of the fuel is going to burn up faster. It's a less efficient process. It's also less uniform and a safe, efficient power plant needs relatively uniform energy density. So you regularly look at kilowatts per linear foot or kilowatts per square foot because I work in an American nuclear power plant. So kilowatts per meter squared or per centimeter squared you would obviously see those in countries that use the metric system. It says that we need nine kilowatts of power per square meter we want to protect with our laser. Nine kilowatts per square meter is nearly 10 times the amount of power Earth's surface receives from the sun. And while that sounds like a lot of energy... So you can't do this with solar. <laughs> We need to remember that water's capacity to absorb energy is incredible. Heating water up to boiling only takes about 10% of the energy. Getting it from liquid to gas takes the other 90%. Ultimately, we're talking about filling the air with tons of hot steam. So basically, we'd be building a human-sized autoclave. Uh, needless to say, autoclaves are not really a popular place to live. But it One other way of looking at this is if you hooked this laser up to a nuclear power plant, and, and when I say that, you just somehow hooked it up right to the main generator so i'm gonna go ahead and make it simple and neglect transmission line losses at this point that you would need to step this down to an appropriate voltage for using a handheld device like this <laughs> at 10 kilowatts per square meter i'm gonna go ahead and round up just because that's an easier number to work with and I'm going to assume you have one gigawatt coming out of the reactor's main turbine. That figures out to only 100,000 square meters, or 0.1 square kilometer. So, the entire might of a nuclear power plant isn't even protecting you from that much rain. And I'm also assuming this laser thing has the right lens configuration and beam expanders, plus the ability to adjust its pitch depending on which direction the rain's coming from because as someone who lives in Texas I'm quite used to it raining sideways so not exactly the most efficient way to use a nuclear power plant it's worse vaporizing a droplet of water with a laser is more complicated than it sounds there are many 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 papers on this subject and the general wow. gist is that it takes a lot of energy delivered fast to vaporize the droplet without just splattering it apart into little droplets 
Here's what it looks like when a droplet gets zapped by a laser pulse. You can see that I'm jealous of anyone whose job it is to literally zap water with lasers. That's true, because it's just gonna, good luck focusing it in that it's this uniform destruction imparting all that energy to completely taking it out. Um, you'd have to, you'd have to surround it. You'd have to somehow surround the individual droplet like you're trying to start a fusion reaction in inertial confinement style. Which, good luck trying to pull something like that off with raindrops. <laughs> You can also see that the laser mostly splatters the droplet rather than vaporizing it. The implication is that completely vaporizing a droplet would probably take even more than the already unreasonable amount of power we were considering. Maybe this will be one of the uses for nuclear fusion, specifically inertial confinement fusion, if anyone can figure that out. Then there's the problem of targeting and aiming. In theory, this is probably solvable, perhaps even without military-grade equipment. High-speed cameras can triangulate the 3D position of a baseball or football hundreds of times per second to help referees make calls. A similar but more sophisticated system could help track the incoming raindrops. I like how they're just kind of showing them hanging up there, presumably attached to the cloud like this is in Super Mario World or something. As for targeting, adaptive optics allows for extremely fast and precise control of beams of light. Covering an area of a square meter would require something like 500 direct pulses of light per second. This is slow enough that you wouldn't run into any direct problems with relativity, but the device would, at minimum, need to be a lot more complicated than just a laser pointer on a swiveling base. So, why isn't he just splitting it into like an expander to just make it over a much larger area? I mean, it wouldn't be instant, it would be kind of like while the individual droplet is falling. Maybe he is. This might just be the graphics of showing what this looks like, because it would be a bit harder to read if he showed it aiming upward. I probably shouldn't take this too seriously. It might seem easier to forget about targeting completely and just fire lasers in random directions. <laughs> if you aim a laser beam in a random direction, how no. far will it go before it hits a drop? This is a pretty easy question to answer. It's the same as asking how far you can see in the rain. And the answer is at least several hundred meters. So unless you're trying to protect your whole neighborhood, firing powerful lasers in random directions probably won't help. Trying to protect your neighborhood, yeah, you might uh, hit people. And also, a beam that would be this powerful, man, this would be like well beyond class four lasers. Um, maybe Styropyro is going to try something like this at, at some point. But people around anywhere near, near this thing is going to need to have the right level of eye protection <laughs> and just the, the, heat, the heat protection because this is connected right to some sort of magical power plant. That little box with the lightning bolt in there is basically a, a micro reactor. And I say micro reactor in that it's small, but we're talking a full size nuclear power plant if you're gonna be even affecting something greater than 0.1 square kilometers. So yeah, it, this is, the point is your neighbors aren't gonna like this even if you don't hit them in the face with a laser. Even a, even seeing like a reflection of that beam off of a droplet is going to be enough to cause severe eye damage, possibly permanent blindness, depending on how close you are to the thing. And honestly, if you are trying to protect your whole neighborhood, firing powerful lasers in random directions <laughs> yeah. definitely won't help. Oh, I'd love to see someone try to get that past their HOA. Though, I don't see why, again, you use just lens expanders and aim it straight up, though. That would probably have less of this effect, though the FAA is still not going to like you, pilots aren't going to like you, and really anyone standing close to the beam, but that would probably minimize this sort of effect. Though the fires could still be there, depending on how much heat your magical generator is producing, so yeah. If that's the case, then you're probably not going to want the rain to go away. The rain might be the one thing preventing this, preventing the fire from spreading. Uh, that was crazy. And I think this probably gave Styropyro another idea if he hasn't thought of one already. If you want to hear more about crazy lasers and crazy power density and Styropyro, I'll pin a comment down below to one of my reactions to one of his videos. Thanks again for the recommendation, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.